Good morning, all you nipple-twisting deviants. Hey, I'm not judging folks. If you gotta do it to get started in the morning, a good nipple-twisting will always do the trick. But ladies and gentlemen, we are here all about All Elite Wrestling Dynamite. Yes, last night, eh, not a bad show. Not hating on it at all. There were some things that went down that, well, I just wouldn't have gone for. So, this went down. 2021 11 I'm sorry I'm sorry still in November folks no it happened December 1st 2021 but that being aside um, AEW took the fight to Atlanta and we all know we had a, a couple of homegrown stars coming out of uh, Atlanta the fans clearly on their side Showcasing what went down some big matches right at the top of the show the main event featuring Cody Rhodes taking on Andrade El Idolo and uh, Here's a, a little problem. I have with AEW every time they have a street fight They go by the city they're in so last night it was an Atlanta street fight uh, time before that was whatever city they were in at that time. Well, if you're going to call us a street fight by the name of the city, well, put a twist on it, folks. Okay, that's just me thinking out loud. Put a twist on it. you got to make it special for each city. If you're going to name it after each city, put a twist on it and give the fans a little bit of extra. Well, I guess they gave it extra, but I'll talk about that later. And was it needed? That's the question, folks. Was it actually needed? Now, due to medical issues, once again, Jim Ross not on the show, recovering. Um, best of wishes to that guy. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, hey, he's doing what he can to get back to the, the commentator table. And that's all that everyone wants from the old guy. Actually, what we want is the old guy to be healthy. Now, we start off the show with Alan Five Angels of the Dark Order taking on Brian Danielson. And you heard very quickly the chance for Alan Angels. Hell, that spilled out through the, uh, the arena quickly. Um, was his hometown, and as the threats continued from Daniel or Brian Danielson, you know, he stayed when he beat up. Colt Cabana, it was going to take place in Colt Cabana City, Chicago. This time we're in Atlanta. Atlanta native Alan Angels is going to get his head kicked in too. And now, one thing I like about Alan Angels, he makes every match exciting that he's involved in. He's fast. He's he's able to move quickly. He's able to adapt to the styles of his opponents. I love that. Um, now, the arena that I guess we were, they were in last night was the same arena in which uh, Alan Angels graduated high school. So that was a double kind of deal for Alan Angels here. And if you weren't watching AEW, you definitely heard the noise from the fans. They loved this kid and uh, definitely had him his back. Now, the American Dragon dominated the hometown hero early on. Uh, outclass him in many ways from the opening bell but Angels a very gutsy baby face I might add fought back with uh, a tope suicida and a moonsault plancha from the top rope to the floor a standing Spanish fly got him a very close near fall now back inside the ring though another moonsault missed and Danielson delivered a running knee strike to the face proceeding to relentlessly stomp the face in of his opponent before applying knee bar for the submission victory. Very hard fought match. Now after the match, Tony Schiavone joined Danielson in the ring and uh, got a little promo from Danielson here. And he stated, if that's the best Atlanta's got, I just kicked his ass. He vowed to continue kicking Dark Order members heads in before showing the entire world that Hangman Page is a one-hit wonder. Now, we all seen Page get up from the commentator's booth. He's going to face Danielson. But in the end, Danielson let him know 
no touching allowed. This is where John Silver came out and made it very clear that Tony Khan stated those two would not touch until they met. Now, this set up for Danielson to take on another Dark Order member in John Silver. I believe that is next week Dynamite. Should be an interesting matchup there. Everyone seems to love John Silver. He, he, he loves to have fun. I think that's what everyone likes about the guy. And the guy is a solid competitor in that ring. Um, Danielson ended up walking away and said that uh, these jerks from Atlanta did not deserve to see what he was going to do to John Silver. Now, as I stated, Danielson defeated Angels. Was a good opening match. I'm not going to complain about it. Always love seeing Danielson in that ring. And I love seeing what these younger guys can do with him. And it's always been on par. I don't think Danielson has had a bad match since joining AEW. And I like the gradual climb. It isn't just, boom, you're in a championship title match. And you haven't done anything. Now, something Danielson has pointed out. And I've got to kind of agree. He's in there doing the hard work. He's in there on Dynamite. He's in there on Rampage. Wrestling every chance he's got. And the champion, Hangman Page, kind of sitting back, resting on his laurels. So it's making Danielson look strong going into Winter is Coming. And um, really setting up for a good feud. And it has been a good feud. Uh, the word exchanging has been pretty damn good um, we, we all know that Danielson struggles with his promos somewhat but he's come a long way since his early days back in WWE um, really like seeing the attitude shift but there was no real explanation for this other than it would have been face taken on face for the championship title the sudden shift in attitude and his tactics haven't quite made sense to me. And I would have liked to have had further information on why. And yes, although I haven't been doing these reviews for a few weeks now because of, you know, personal issues, um, I've been watching AEW wrestling, especially AEW Dynamite and Rampage. And it's good to see Danielson, guys like CM Punk, um, Chris Jericho, establishing these young stars. It is. It is good. But sometimes more information, more reasoning would help. That's my only problem with this. The sudden shift in Danielson's attitude when they brought him in and he was like far beyond being a heel. Clearly a face and the fans loved him. And then he won that uh, tournament. And boom, he is, uh, he's an asshole. Didn't make much sense to me. It's all my, my only complaint. Love seeing Danielson in the ring. And I'm looking forward to the match between him and Hangman Adam Page. Now, following this, CM Punk would take on Lee Moriarty. Um, before I get into this match, it's been seven years that the fans have been begging CM Punk to come back to wrestling. They didn't care where. They wanted him back in the wrestling world. It didn't matter if it was WWE. It didn't matter if it was Ring of Honor. It didn't matter where it was. As long as CM Punk was back in action and exciting the fans the way he used to. Now, upon his return, all that momentum, and he comes out and he challenges Darby Allen, his first match, official match, being Darby Allen, and a good match it was. It was it was like, damn, you know, he still has it. He's back. But since then, on a weekly basis, it looks like the guy is struggling each and every match. There's no there's no rise in his status. Oh sure, he's undefeated. But being undefeated and staying in the same spot week in and week out yes the feud with him and MJF it looks good 
the word exchange this week not the greatest last week boom on par you know it hit right where it needed to be and established a good solid feud but this week there was a lot of reaching a lot of reaching and things that uh, could have been done without from MJF as well as CM Punk Lee Moriarty six years in the business the kid looks phenomenal the problem is you bring a guy like CM Punk into AEW the fans want the excitement that CM Punk used to bring they don't want to see the happy happy joy joy bullshit they want to see that edge that that fight and yes he showcases that in his matches I'm not going to shit on what the guy can do in the ring I am simply stating in my own opinion that each and every week he's actually looking weaker than he is looking better looking stronger he's struggling and what it says to me is he's struggling to compete against these younger stars and they're outshining him because of it this week the match ended looked like it was just plain luck yes he hit the GTS yes he got the one two three barely this is CM Punk this is the man the fans have been crying for for seven years come back be our star our shining light in the wrestling world be the voice of the voiceless well here in AEW the fans have a voice that's the problem he can't use that moniker anymore he can't use that those type of promos the pipe bomb just ain't gonna work because for the most part AEW is hitting the fans right where they need to this week though they struggle to do so so if the viewership is a little bit down this week I can understand why CM Punk should have been shot not to the top I don't need to see him on every episode I don't need to see him in the ring all the time now guys like MJF and CM Punk those matches are gonna look great okay he looked great against Darby Allen yes Danielson has won his way into a title picture but CM Punk should be saying hey I'm undefeated I'm untouchable Sammy Guevara I'm taking your TBS championship title just my opinion it is basically an open challenge title so CM Punk can interject himself into it anytime he wants now let's get into the match now we all witnessed Lee Moriarty taking a big win over Nick Camarado and uh, it was a could say a career defining matchup last night with CM Punk a lot of these guys they grew up watching CM Punk they they loved him they wanted to be the quality wrestler that he was at that time so I think this is good Lee Moriarty fantastic in the ring he moves quick he is agile he can do things that many men can't do in that ring and the fans love him so it's all good but was this match needed against CM Punk that's the question now like I stated this kid grew up Lee Moriarty grew up watching CM Punk honed his uh, craft a lot like Punk and established himself as an individual but before the match could begin MJF made his way out to commentary you seen the nasty look coming from CM Punk he knew there was trouble coming by the end of the match Moriarty out wrestled Punk early drawing sharp criticism from MJF towards the latter and yes MJF talked shit throughout the match but a lot of what he said a lot of the shit he spewed kind of hit the button if you know what I mean every time Punk has been in that ring since Darby Allen he looks like he's struggling and he MJF pointed that out every damn time he lost his killer instinct the Chicago native not quite a killer like he used to be 
Moriarty countered a crossbody into a roll-up, then into a submission. Punk fought out, survived a series of pinfall reversals, and rocked his opponent with a single kick to the back of the head. Now, a good question MJF put in was, why is this match lasting as long as it has? It is a clear sign that he is no longer CM Punk, but PG Punk. The underdog would kick out after a pin attempt by Punk and drove him into the mat, but could only keep him down for a two. Moments later, Punk escaped his opponent's grasp and countered into the go to sleep for the pinfall victory. But like I stated earlier on, it looked like a fluke victory. It wasn't a solid victory in my eyes. Now that's my eyes, that's my opinion. People might shit on my review. I'm not bitching. I'm just stating that CM Punk could have been brought in a lot different. He was brought in taking on Darby Allen, a top young star, a homegrown star, as they like to call him, one of the four pillars. Now, yes, he's got an upcoming match against MJF, but a victory over MJF, is that going to do the trick now? He has looked like he has been hammered week in and week out. He's come off looking weak. I don't know, folks. It was a good match. I'm not going to shit on this match. Lee Moriarty looked good. CM Punk looked tired. Haggard. Slow. He's got to step it up a little bit. He's got to bring the fans what they want to see when he hits that ring. CM Punk doesn't need to be in the main event every time he's on the show. But he should be the talk of the show. Not the butt of a lot of jokes. And believe me, I've seen a lot of jokes made of some of the performances by Punk. The Punk, Punk fans are solid fans. Hell, I am a CM Punk fan. Don't get me wrong. I'm not shitting on the match. I'm not shitting on what they gave us. But you bring a guy in like Punk, you got to bring him in strong because this is what the fans have wanted for seven fucking years. Now, after the match, MJF accused Punk of trying to get Brit in get into Brick ba Baker's pants. Something I didn't see that uh, was warranted. Called him one Punk. I'm sorry, one Pump Chump. Now, why I said this wasn't needed, this was reaching. This was something that wasn't needed because everybody knows CM Punk is already married to a former champion, AJ Lee. And I believe most fans would uh, react that uh, AJ Lee is a lot better looking than Britt Baker. But that's besides the point looks don't have anything to do about it when it comes to in-ring action i think aj lee brought more excitement than Britt baker just my thoughts the salt of the earth said punk needs him more than he needs the former world champion i'm a spark to a flame you haven't seen since 2011 MJ have vowed to be better than Brett in Canada, Piper in Portland, and Punk in Chicago. Well, these two will collide. And when finally insulted by, while well, insulting the Chicago natives, that was when Punk got out of the ring, confronted, or went to confront MJF on the stage. Wardlow came out. Nice segue in the Wardlow's match. But, I'm going to say this, was a good match. Lee Moriarty... CM Punk, they put on a good show. Just the show needed something more from CM Punk. Like I stated, like outside of putting Moriarty over, you can't book the kid any stronger than you did last night. On the other hand, though, you can book Punk a whole lot stronger. Um, well, MJF's promo was fine, but like I stated earlier, it felt like it was reaching grasping, as CM Punk would call it, at low-hanging fruit. The Brick Baker lines, as I stated, made no sense, seen as Punk is married to AJ Lee, a former world champion. Um, the verbal back and forth, as stated, lacked a lot this, this week. 
last week's show hit every button. The appearance of Wardlow at the end of the segment came out to protect to protect MJF from, well, a much-deserved ass-whooping. Set up Punk for a match with the jacked-up heavyweight sooner rather than later. Um, I can see that happening before he gets to get in a, a match with MJF. He will have to face Wardlow. Um, now, like I said, nice setup uh, with Wardlow. He was in action, but before we went there, Orange Cassidy interrupted Adams Cole attempt to join the commentary team only to end up receiving well a three on one beatdown courtesy of Cole and the super clicks in the Young Bucks. Chuck Taylor and Wheeler Utah made the save for their best friend, chasing the heels off with a steel chair. Moments later Wardlow and Sean Spears made their way down to ringside for a match with AC Adams squash match folks this is something it's used a lot with big tough men Wardlow is a big tough guy he's an ass kicker but at this point I want to see the guy wrestle a little bit I want to see him do something more than be a Brock Lesnar wannabe hit one move and finish the match and that's what basically happened. Steamrolled his through his opponent, put him down with four consecutive power bombs, got the one, two, three in this one-sided affair. Now, after the match, obviously, Sean Spears came in with the chair to get his little bit of uh, spotlight, breaking the chair over the body of the fallen opponent of Wardlow. Um... You know, if they're looking to build Warlow up as a jacked up uh, badass, they're doing that. But I don't think fans want to see someone just come in there and just do one move. They've seen this. They've seen this from WWE. They've seen this from Brock Lesnar. Suplex after suplex after suplex. I want to see a guy wrestle. I want to see what he can do in that ring. Because at this point, you look at Warlow. He comes in there 60 seconds, maybe two minutes, maybe three minutes sometimes, maybe. Well, when he faces a guy like Punk, we know he's going to utilize that power to his advantage. But after a certain amount of time, you are setting this guy up to lose steam. You are looking at setting him up to get winded, and that is where the other guy takes over. And yes, this is a tactic that has been used with heels throughout the wrestling world for, hell, I don't know how many generations. But it's time to do these big guys a little bit of justice, show what they can really do in that ring. Now, it's a nice way to also hide the uh, the bad things about these characters. The lack of range of movement and mobility. Yes, I agree. But this is what your training centers are for. This is what you guys need to be looking at the veterans for. Getting them to teach these guys how to move a little bit different. Teach them how to exercise a little bit different. Don't just be jacked up. Be agile. Be flexible. Go in there. Be a true ass kicker. Hone your craft the way you should. Don't just be another big guy with a one move. It's not going to turn the fans on. Yes, the fans are going to pop when he finally turns on MJF. And that's what they're setting him up for. To turn on MJF. Now, inevitably, he will be facing Punk in a match. It's smart booking and will help in the CM Punk and Wardlow match for the setup for CM Punk and MJF. But, in the end, does it make Wardlow look good as well? I don't know. Um, let's see. The uh, super click segueing into another six-man feud with the best friends. It's not going to satisfy the fans. Yes, it's fun to see. Yes, the six-man tags. Uh, there's been a lot of talk that the fans want to see the six-man titles brought in to AEW. I love six-man tag matches. Anything can kind of happen. And usually ends up with a brawl with all six men in that ring. But make it a serious division then. If you're going to keep on bringing these six-man tags in, fine. But the fans are going to get sick of it. They want to see more of Adam Cole. They want to see more of what he can do alone. 
and constantly putting him in these six-man tag matches, it's kind of holding him back, and I don't want to see that. A guy like Adam Cole, the fans love him. They're behind him. Even when he's a heel, the fans are behind this guy. They need to use that chemistry he has with Orange Cassidy to break him out in a solo matches and bring him up to the upper ladder and, like, the TBS title. Open challenge. Same as Punk, you know? I don't care. Have Punk start off as TBS champion. Doesn't bother me. Or TNT champion. Whatever it's called. It doesn't matter to me. This guy should be climbing up the ladder. He's undefeated. Adam Cole brought him in a lot of heat on his shoulders right away. Reforming the Bullet Club, so to speak, here in AEW. You know, Adam Cole, once a leader of the uh, the Bullet Club, I do believe, and uh, a big part of the Bullet Club in New Japan Pro Wrestling. But they're kind of losing that steam they have had him come in as and just keep on segueing him into the six-man tags. It's not doing him any justice. Orange Cassidy, I'm going to say this now. I don't mind the laid-back attitude in the locker room, in promos, or when he's on commentary. But when you are facing off a guy that you're supposed to have a feud with, you go and shove your hands in your pockets, and you do these little tap kicks on the shin, you deserve to be punched in the mouth. You deserve a good old-fashioned ass-whooping. When it is time to do business, take your hands out of your pockets. Kick a guy like you mean it. Okay, the gimmick, it's run its course. The fans, the kids, they love it. You see kids almost every week, whenever they see Orange Cassidy, they show a kid in the, in the front row dressed up like Orange Cassidy. The kids love him, but there is an extent to this gimmick. There is a limit. When you step your ass into the ring, you own that ring. And it's not owning the ring when you're looked at as a joke. Darby Allen and Sting would take on the Gun Club. Yes, a battle of two undefeated tag teams. Darby Allen and Sting wearing the same face paint. It looked good. Um, it was quite different seeing Sting in that kind of paint. And made him look, I think, older. <laughs> than it was intended to. But if you're going with his age and then the skull kind of paint mixed in with his normal crow paint, well, I guess if you're facing and knocking on death's door, you might as well look the part. Well, like I said, two undefeated teams doing battle, not a bad thing. The recent uh, feud culminating here to uh, last night as Sting and Darby Allen battled Billy and Colton Gunn. I love Colton Gunn. I've always loved Billy Gunn. Billy Gunn, D-Generation X days, but before that, when he was with the Smoking Guns. You know, Billy and Bart Gunn. Great tag team. Um, the eventual split up, much like the Rockers. Um, it always seems to go down that way. But, Billy Gunn has always had a star quality about him. I think he could have been champion in his younger days if they would have given him the opportunity. But he was always held back, it seemed. Never was the right time, I guess you could say. Um, Austin Gunn accompanied his brother and his father to the squared circle. Sting dominated early, but attacked Allen and an ill-fated springboard coffin drop allowed the heels to take control Entering into a commercial break, and, and this is one part I hate. I, you know, I like I can see some of the action in the split screen, but they could make it a little bit bigger, okay? You're missing a lot. Uh, the former TNT champion made the hot tag to the icon, who again exploded into a, the match and uploaded, I'm sorry, unloaded on the competition. He trapped Colton in the Scorpion Deathlock, but Austin entered the ring behind the official's back after a much-needed distraction by Billy Gunn. Wiped Sting out with a shot to the face. Billy followed up with a famous sir, but Colton could not score the pinfall. Now, Allen wiped out Austin and then followed it up by taking Billy Gunn out with a tope suicida that looked fucking sick. He hit him with his shoulder blades. I'm talking Darby Allen here. Went through the ropes. 
twisted his body, hit his shoulder blades against the pectoral region of Billy Gunn. Billy Gunn, a massive dude. For a guy his age, talk about being jacked up. And I think if Billy Gunn would have wanted to, he could have no-sold it. He could have just probably taken a step back. Because Darby Allen impacting like he did, he twisted his whole body, dropped him on the floor. Billy Gunn followed suit. Um, excuse me. Now, he ended up doing this, uh, I, don't, I don't even know what to call it. It is a stunner, but he grabs the, the person like an, an inverted DDT and then flips over his shoulder to deliver the stunner. Followed up with a Scorpion Death Drop by Sting. T took the win. Now the Gun Club defeated. Um, you know, Darby Allen. it's good to see him with a legend like Sting. It's only going to help him in the end. But I don't think it's always needed. I don't. And it's not always needed. I think Darby could do a little bit more on his own. And we've seen him do a lot of it on his own. But Sting's always in his corner. And he gets a lot of heat from that from the heels. <laughs> You need Big Daddy Sting in your corner to feel secure. Now, we've seen Sting also do the whole and accompany him out on stage. You know, they have a couple of words, and then Sting goes to the back. Let's Darby do his own thing. But I don't believe he needs Sting in tag team matches. Now, I can see them perhaps maybe segueing these guys into a title match against the champions eventually. But... Do you really want to see Darby Allen as a tag team champion? I know I don't. Okay, establish tag teams. And you have some of those. So make sure they are established tag teams. They're not going off on their own unless the feud with another tag team warrants it. Following this match backstage, 2.0 and Daniel Garcia attack Chris Jericho as he's being interviewed, leaving him lying following a steel chair shot from Matt Martell. Um... You know, I said my piece on it. Um, Chris Jericho, we seen that last week where he got in the faces of Blockhead and his uh, crew. Um, I don't know what they're working towards. Chris Jericho taking on Daniel Garcia or Blockhead. I don't know. Uh, the match with Singh and Allen, it was a good match. But, I don't know. I'm kind of happy and I'm hoping that this feud is now over. It's just my take on it. I don't think it's needed. I think the Gun Club could have done more in tag team matches before they were defeated. I think they're making a good heel team. TBS Championship Tournament quarterfinal, the final one. Ruby Soho taking on Chris Statlander. Um, a very slow start. Um, the fans, I don't know. I it, Maybe it's my bad hearing. I just didn't hear them into the match. They were at the, at the beginning, they were, but it kind of lost steam midway through. And then as the match started picking up, it was like they could have gone another 5, 10 minutes with this match. And then all of a sudden, just boom, you know, it's done. Um, you know, besides a promo by Britt Baker, the only female match on this show, again... You got two hours. I know you got a lot going on, but maybe give them a little bit more. That's all I'm saying. I've said it every time I do those review shows. It's lacking a women's division, a strong women's division. Yes, this tournament is to establish the first TBS champion. Could have done more with it. Now, it went longer than some of the matches I've seen in this tournament, but in the end, it just fell short. That's all I'm saying. Soho taking on Statlander. The fans did the cheers. Ruby, Statlander at the beginning. Um, the two showing a lot of respect in, at the beginning, but in the end, taking those final shots to try and get, get the, the win. Back and forth action dominated the opening uh, moments of the match before a quick commercial break. Yes, we had to suffer through that again. Statlander dropped Soho with the blue thunderbomb for, got, for a two. Then drove her back to the mat for another dramatic near fall. The resilient Ruby Soho fought back and looked for her no future finisher, but Statlander countered. Looked to finish her opponent with the Big Bang Theory. That did not work. Soho countered 
into a roll-up for a hard-fought victory. But like I stated, it just ended up being too short. Give these women another five minutes. And I think they would have been able to get the fans really into it. Got them screaming a little bit. I'm a big Statlander fan. I love Ruby Soho, but I like Statlander a lot more. Um, if they ever do a women's tag division, two women, and this is just my opinion, that I think would look good together, Jamie Hayter and Chris Statlander in a tag team. They've got a very similar physiques, stature. You got a whole lot of attitude from Jamie Hayter. You got the uh, kind of calm, cool collectiveness of Chris Statlander. Like I stated, if given more time, I think this match could have done really, really good. It wasn't a bad match. You had two women that the fans love, but Ruby Soho would go on. And uh, we're out of the quarterfinals now. Um, at the end of the match, though, as Chris Statlander was making her way up the ramp, we got Vicky Guerrera distracting her so that way Ny Nyla Rose could sweep in the ring and do some damage against Ruby Soho. Soften her up a little bit, if you will, to uh, make sure that Ruby Soho was a little bit weakened before those two faced in the semifinals. Finally, main event, Atlanta Street Fight. Why can't we just call it a street fight, folks? This is what I'm talking about. Why can't we just call it a street fight? Why does it have to be a... Atlanta street fight? Why does it have to be a Chicago street fight? Why does it have to be a Pittsburgh street fight? Why do we need to name these street fights after the cities? I spoke about this at the top of the show. It's not needed. If you're going to do it, put a twist on it. Okay? Simple. Now, besides that complaint, I've got to say this is the best match I've seen Cody in in a long time. It's probably one of the better matches of Andrade El Idolo that I've seen since he came here to AEW. Now, my problem, Pac and Malachi Black have had a big presence in this feud. Where the hell were they? We seen Glock Anderson and, you know, whoever the jabroni is in the corner of El Idolo, I can never remember his name. No, we'll call him Rico, okay? <laughs> But we've seen them throughout the match going back and forth a little bit. But at the very beginning, when this suited up little prick went to attack um, Arn Anderson on the ramp, Arn Anderson misstep fell into a safe place there on the, on the stage as Andrade attacked... Uh, Cody Rhodes. Now these two would battle throughout the stands for a bit, back and forth. Finally take the fight to the ring. We've seen everything being taken out. Tables, chairs, chains. we also seen Cody Rhodes pull out a kendo stick and then a sledgehammer. Kind of a little shot at Triple H there. I don't know at this point if it's out of respect or just to have a little bit of fun. But he looked at it, tossed it aside, went back under. I don't know. Uh, a lot of things pulled out. Now, here's some things this match did not need. It did not need Cody Rhodes' wife coming in at the very end, setting the table on fire. There was no need in this match to bring it to that extreme. It wasn't needed. The fight was fantastic from both men. A great back-and-forth matchup. This is where they missed the mark. There was no need to have that table set on fire. I don't understand it. I don't even understand his wife's presence in the ring needed. It wasn't. There's never been any shots taken at Cody Rhodes' wife. Brandy Rhodes was never a part of this feud. I don't understand it. On top of that, they put the table so damn close to the corner that it was mainly Cody Rhodes taking the brunt of going through the table. A superplex, you set it up so the table is enough distance away that your opponent is being driven through that table. 
Instead, Cody Rhodes was probably set more aflame than Andrade El Idolo. Now, don't get the angry Viking wrong. He's not pissed off about the match. He's pissed off about the ending because they could have finished this match off in so many different ways that made sense. Hell, they could have had Andrade going over Cody Rhodes. In my eyes, I think that was needed. Every time Cody Rhodes is put in a feud, he loses the first few, and then he makes the ultimate comeback. It's not needed. Don't get me wrong. I'm not hating on Cody Rhodes. But the fans are telling you something. The fans are telling you you are better as a heel than a face. Now, being your hometown Atlanta, the fans were on your side once. But you also could hear the chants. Cody Rhodes sucks. So it was kind of split. Now near the end, it started picking up again. But you kind of seen the gas kind of being let out of the fans with the table spot. We've seen great things happen in this match. And I'm hoping it's the final chapter between these two. Or Andrade El Idolo comes back and creams this motherfucker in the teeth. Cody Rhodes finally has this kind of moment. Loses his shit and is seen for what he truly is. A better heel than he is a better face my opinion that is all okay talk about a fight chaotic straight up brawl for the most parts on the ramp throughout the stands the fans were loving it they were in this match i think their hopes were andrade was going to get over now being a home crowd a lot of the fans wanted cody to go over they wanted the face to get the win i can understand that this is his hometown but it was not needed for him to win. El Idolo sees the upper hand lashing Rhodes with his own weight belt, then blasting him with a laptop. Rhodes, as always, was busted open. Not at this point, but later on there in the match. Rhodes answered with a low blow, which he received earlier on. When El Idolo recovered and tried for a moonsault, the American Nightmare sent a steel chair up into his face. Now, um, Idolo almost landed on the arm of, uh, of Cody Rhodes there, but it looked great. This is what I'm saying. Was the flaming table needed? Seeing as it looked like Cody Rhodes was hurt more in the end than El Idolo. A chair shot from El Idolo busted Rhodes open, something we expect when Cody's in a match, but could not stop him from retrieving a sledgehammer from underneath the ring. He tossed it aside, as I stated earlier. Instead, he opted for a golden shovel. El Idolo's second Jose, who it is, I did write it down, rushed the ring with a taser in hopes of stunning Rhodes. But he ate the shovel across his face. Andrade flew over the ring post and wiped him out. Now back inside, Andrade delivered a running knee strike, driving a chair back into the face of Rhodes, with kind of like a meteora. From one side across the ring, raced across, drove that chair right in the face. Face fucked Cody Rhodes, so to speak. A hip toss through a table that Cody or that Cody was looking to put uh, El Idolo through did not work out in his way. Uh, <clears throat> now, something I also noticed, El Idolo had a lot of problems putting the table into the ring. Kept on putting it in the wrong way. The legs always hook in the middle rope. Something Andrade has to look at a little bit more when he's trying to introduce tables into the game. Uh, later, Andrade set up another table and sprawled Cody out on it. Rhodes crotched him on the top rope. This is when Brandy Rhodes comes in. Squirts a bunch of lighter fluid all over the table, sets it aflame. Rhodes proceeds to deliver an inverted suplex over the top rope. From the top turnbuckle, I should say through the table for the win. All the while a piece of uh, fire is still aflame upon his arm. I said it throughout this match, I don't see it, need to see it again. There was no reason for Brandy Rhodes. There was no reason for the flaming table. Nothing in this feud between these two men or Malachi Black 
deserved the flaming table. You kind of lost us at the end there. El Idolo losing, probably not the wisest choice. You want a guy like El Idolo to start climbing that ranking. You want him to start getting up into that upper echelon where he can challenge for the world title or a TBS title to start him off. If you don't want all these WWE guys to be your top wrestlers right away. Um, now here's the problem I have with this. Everyone's crying, oh, they're WWE stars. You're giving them the upper spots because they clearly had a lot of TV time. You're holding your, your homegrowns down. Fuck you, this is the wrestling world. Okay, get over it. They work for WWE. They came in with a lot of star power already. Some of them underutilized. Some of them held back. Why should being a WWE former employee have anything to do with what they are doing in AEW? If you are seeing better things from them here in AEW, why should they be held back just because they used to work for WWE? It's not needed. Okay, so everybody get off your fucking little pedestal there and bitching every time a WWE former talent gets a shot or gets a little bit more star power and spotlight than these guys that AEW hired at the beginning. Piss off with it. It's not needed. These are wrestlers. Let them do their job and if one guy gets over more than the other because, well, he's a little bit more known. Well, that just makes the other guy fight a little bit better in that ring. Gives us a little bit more in that ring or in a promo. And we get a shining star regardless. This isn't WCW back in the day. This is not WWE. A lot of organic moments have happened since AEW came into being. So people need to stop with this asinine conclusion that if you are a star or if you were a favored star in WWE, then you shouldn't be given the spotlight in AEW. You should simply be used to put over other talent. Look at CM Punk. That's all he's done since he came in. Yes, he defeated Darby Allin. But... Since then, it's kind of looked like he's gone downhill. He's barely pulling out wins. At least that's the way they're portraying it. I don't want to see it. Okay, you brought CM Punk in because you knew it was going to get you pops. You knew it was going to get you viewership. Well, look at since his debut. The viewership has decreased because they're not seeing the CM Punk of old. They're not seeing something new. While they're seeing something new, they're seeing old man punk. Daniel Bryan is the only one that's really come in and held that steam. When is that going to fizzle out? Because the fans are in an uproar because he's former WWE talent. Well, if you look at it this way, CM Punk and Danielson and many other stars were from other companies as well. Triple A. Fucking New Japan Pro Wrestling. Um, hell, Ring of Honor, Impact. Come on, people. Where do you draw the line? We'll talk about this more in another episode. Maybe we come up with a new series here on Pillar to Post called Angry This Morning. And I can be as angry as I want to be and people not think I'm being negative on a show I actually enjoyed. I'm just pointing out facts and mistakes that they can improve on. If you don't like a little bit of anger in your review, then what the hell are you doing watching a review show? Thank you all very much. Have a great day. Have a better tomorrow. And I'm going to leave you with this. Tomorrow! Pillar to Post is back to regular broadcast streaming. Yes, it is either going to be, re uh, I'm sorry, Renegade Wrestling Organization, or it's going to be Big Dog Wrestling using WWE 2K19 because, well, we don't have anything better at the moment. So, like I stated, have a great day. Have a better tomorrow, but for now.
I am out of here. Let's go kick a few buckets.